Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you so much that we can gather this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus. And for his promise that when we gather together in his name, he is here in our midst. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to his presence. We pray, O oh Father, that in word and in sacrament, song and in prayer, Jesus would be exalted and lifted up and all drawn to him. So we yield to you and we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. It's terrific to be with you. We've actually been on the coast since yesterday. Uh, my wife and I drove down to Fort Pierce for to me to preside at our ordination of a very talented woman by the name of Lisa Hinkle. And uh, of course, when I, they heard that I was coming here, I heard again the story about this church on the barge, making its way up the St. John's River, uh, and they wanted me to be sure to extend their greetings to you. By the way, um, some of you know, if you're delegates to this upcoming diocesan convention, is that one of the things that we've done is that I commissioned a documentary to be made of the history of the Diocese of Central Florida. Uh, that's going to be shown, and then there will be disc copies available for each congregation. And one of the things that happens is Ernie Bennett telling the story of him as a child being on the bridge and seeing the church, this church, on the barge and having no idea, of course, what he was looking at. Uh, <laughs> only later to become the rector of St. Andrews and seeing it all firsthand. Uh, it's a great documentary. I don't really go into that. It starts from literally the first settlers of the St. John's River all the way up to the present, in 35 minutes, no less. <laughs> it's terrific. It will it, it give Ken Burns a run for his money. Um, what I want to talk about today is this gospel reading, the story of the baptism of Jesus. That's, of course, what we're commemorating. John the Baptist, Jesus being baptized. What well, is it often the case for us, because we've heard the story so many times, is in fact the kind of startling shock value that would have registered for the people who originally read this gospel. Uh, the Gospel of Mark historically is the earliest of all four of the gospels with much of the content coming directly from Peter's eyewitness accounts of what it was like for him to be with Jesus and the stories that surrounded his life and ministry. And so in this very, very compact gospel, we get a lot of mileage even in the midst of very, very short stories. And so what I want to do briefly is talk a little bit about some of the more startling aspects, at least to their first readers, as first readers, and then talk about what that might mean for us, you and me. So it really begins with John himself. Um, John was considered by those in his generation as a prophet, as we do as well, the last of the prophets before the coming of Jesus. What is a surprise is his message. You see, here's John. He's not preaching in the center of the square of Jerusalem. He's way out in the wilderness somewhere. And he's asking, calling, perhaps even by God's declaration demanding, people come out from their normal circumstances, the places where they live and work and worship, and to come out there. His very life is in fact a rejection of all that they would necessarily hold dear, or at least put value in. He's, he's a hermit. He lives off the land. There's nothing fine or lovely about anything that represents him calling these people who live here to repentance and for that repentance to be expressed in a very, very specific way, a way that they would find shocking. You see, he was calling them to baptism. Now, here's the point. In the first century, there were only two groups of people in Judaism who were, who were baptized. The first were non-Jews, Gentiles, who wanted to convert into Judaism. You would 
have a Gentile identity, but what would happen is, is that when you went into the water of baptism and came up on the other side into this big, huge, almost like a freestanding swimming pool that they called the mikvah, they were very clear, and I know you will hear in my description echoes of our understanding of baptism now. There's a change of identity going under the water was literally a burial of the old life. And coming back up out of the water, you receive a new identity. You are no longer to be thought of as a Gentile, not even a former Gentile, or someone who used to be a Gentile. Uh, none of this sort of second-class stuff like happens in some Episcopalian churches where, you know, the Episcopalian leaves it over to the other one and says, yeah, but you know, he used to be a Baptist. <laughs> that's, that's not what they did. In fact, it was forbidden by rabbinic law that once you come through the waters of the mikvah in baptism and your identity had changed from Gentile to Jew, you were actually not allowed to reference that old life. It was as if it no longer existed. Which is exactly, you see, our understanding of what God does when he forgives. He says, I will remember your sins no more. Now, how can um, an omniscient God choose to forget? I don't know, but see, he's God, he can do whatever he wants to. <laughs> and I don't mean that position. In other words, there is something within the economy of God that when, as it says in 1 John, we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us, but also to cleanse, literally to wipe it away. So it, it is as if it never happened. That's what baptism was. For these Gentiles who come under the water of baptism and come out on the other side, they are not form or anything. They are now fully and completely Jews. Then there was a second group of people who went through the water, and those were people who were in some way ritually unclean by something that they did. In other words, we're talking sanitation. Like if you touch dead bodies, for example, then you had to go through the cleansing before you could go present yourself for worship. Now, think about this. You're a Jew. You've been a Jew all of your life. Your forebears were all Jews. You've been someone who has been faithful in temple worship. If you're a man, you've been circumcised. And yet John is telling you the sign of repentance for your lack of faith is baptism. You're calling them Gentiles at this point. You're saying that your relationship with God is so corrupt, so, as it were, degraded, that it, it is as if you need to start all over. It was, for them, a shocking, startling call to come into the place of baptism. No wonder, while lots of people came out and many of them were baptized, the Pharisees, the people who were responsible for making sure the law was obeyed and temple worship happened, they came up and they just sort of stood like this. Paul said, John said to them, you're a brood of vipers. <laughs> He didn't know a lot about political correctness, did he? <laughs> so that's startling call number one. That John standing outside of the commerce and religious life of Judaism in Jerusalem would say, come out to this dangerous, wild place called the wilderness, as if to renounce that old way of life, and not just geographically, but literally in the waters of, in this case, the Jordan River saying, my relationship with God is so corrupt that I need to start all over again with a whole new identity before God. Because that's what John was asking of them. But then, in a way that shocked everyone, even including those who came out, was that here is this prophet that they figured was thought of him as peerless. There had not been a prophet like this in generations in Israel. So this was, the, this was the, literally the reformation of something very, very new, emerging right in front of them. But yet, what is John saying? He says, in essence, I'm not the one. He said, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the palm of his sandal. Well, who does that in Judaism? Slaves. It was dirty business. 
Nobody untied sandals, except the lowest of the low on the pecking order. And so here is the peerless prophet <coughs> saying that there's someone else coming, and in relationship to him, he's not even worthy to untie sandals. But then he says something even more shocking. I have baptized you with water, but he, meaning this one, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, what you've done now is a symbolic action where you're letting go of an old way of life and choosing to come into the new one. But it's water on the body. It's a symbol of a resolution. There is one who is actually coming who is going to take that very same action, that immersion, only the immersion is not going to be an immersion in water. It's going to be an immersion in the Holy Spirit, not something just rolling over you, something actually coming into the very depths of who you are, changing and transforming and giving you a new identity in the deepest parts of your heart and of your mind. Something that none of us could ever do for ourselves and no washing could ever do in and of itself. This is an action that only God can accomplish, which is a part of the shock value is who has the power to do that? Not just another rabbi, not even in fact a prophet. In other words, in that word that Jesus is, that Paul, that John, I'm sorry, is saying to them, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. It's automatically sign one in the Gospel of Mark that it's the Messiah. It's the Son of God who is coming. And then, <laughs> it's like they escalate in the midst of their shock value. What happens? This one, Jesus, comes and says, I'm here to be baptized. Do you remember in the Gospel of John, there's this little sort of off-camera dialogue that happens. And... John is like horrified that Jesus would come. What are you doing here? I'm the one who should be receiving baptism from you, John says of Jesus. But what does Jesus say? He says, let this be so that it might fulfill all righteousness. What does he mean by that? Two things. First of all, part of what he's saying in the midst of all of that is to fulfill all righteousness, I'm setting a new pace. Righteousness as in, what do I require of my followers? And what I am asking of them is baptism. What I am asking of them is to do exactly what it is, John, that you are doing, but it is, has a whole different level of meaning. It's a recognition of the fact that I am broken, that I am sinful, that my relationship with God is corrupt, if existent at all, that there's something inside of me that so powerfully needs to change and is so big, it's nothing that I can even begin to create for myself. There's a transformation that I see in my life that I know needs to happen, but I can't do it. It's not just a question anymore of regulation or trying harder. In fact, baptism is meant to bring me to the end of my own efforts and resolutions, to come actually as an admission of defeat, that I can't get there. I might long for it. I might desire it. But the fact of the matter is God has to be the one that breaks through, that decisions, do your resolutions, efforts only get me so far. It actually doesn't change the deepest part of my heart. That's what I am begging God to do. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what I'm asking of my followers. To literally come into the water of identification with me to receive a new kind of righteousness that can only come from Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit coming in and immersing our hearts and creating a change in us that only he can accomplish. Number one. Number two, to fulfill all righteousness is a way of saying an unequivocal sign that who Jesus is, is in fact the Messiah, the Son of God. He steps into the water and what happens? The heavens tear open, it says literally in the Greek. And the Holy Spirit comes down powerfully and yet gently, almost as if a dove. And not so there's an anointing that happens, a public sign. I don't know how they saw the Holy Spirit come down like a dove. But that's what they describe in the text. And not only something visible, but something audible. A voice comes from heaven and says what? He says, you, meaning Jesus, you are my son. Full of authority, can do all that is given to him by his father, 
all of the rights and privileges that were given to firstborn sons in that culture, all of the inheritance, all of the authority of the family name, all that is given the Father, I am giving to you, you are my son. And in a wonderful expression of tenderness, not just my son, the beloved. That is not something many people would have expected God to say. Tender, deeply intimate. A part of what happens when we come into our relationship with Jesus is that we begin to discover something very new about God. And that who is God? He is the one who looks at us and says, you are my beloved. I care about you. You deeply matter. The beloved, in you, he says to Jesus, I am well pleased. They would not have expected that to have been spoken over any man. And yet what the sign is signifying is that it's more than a man. It is, in fact, God in the flesh, the Messiah. The shock value is meant to so unsettle us that we begin to think about ourselves in a different kind of way. He's not just interested in giving his readers some sort of startup. He's actually meant to, in some ways, shape them so they actually begin to see themselves and to see God differently. I want to read you a quote from Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And he's talking about the purpose of the Gospel of Mark. He says, quote, the point of the Gospel is that we should encounter there a reality alarmingly beyond human expectation. And that through this encounter, we should be changed bit by bit into the sort of person who can actually understand what is being asked of us and what has been made possible for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, to say yes to Jesus Christ to understand ourselves as a part of that story, as people who have been baptized into Christ, is a way of thinking about ourselves that is entirely different from the autonomous human being who is charting the course for himself, needing the help of no one. Just the opposite. This is, this is one who is learning to bend the knee in humility. A public admission of corruption and brokenness. Someone who is willing to even risk the public act of baptism because I need this Savior so desperately. I need my heart to be changed. And the good news of the story is, is that it is in fact meant to be for us a genuine message of hope. That just because he is the one who is coming in to fulfill all righteousness, the word made flesh, God knowing everything about what it means to be human in the very flesh of Jesus, that we in fact, by his very example, were invited to follow into his way. That we can come to him with all of who we are and know that when we pour out the deepest parts of our heart to God, he is more than willing, ready to hear, to listen, to receive, and not just to sort of objectively listen, but actually intimately and personally listen because he cares about us so profoundly and so deeply that he wants to come in and work the kind of changes in our hearts that we desire. There's a quote from Gregory of Nazianzus, who's a fourth century Turkish early church father. I know for most people the whole idea of a major doctor of the church coming out of Turkey is an anachronism. But back then, it was a huge center of Christian life and faith. And he writes this about this passage. He says, Jesus rises from the water, and a drowned world rises with him. That's us. It's not an example that we look at from afar. Instead, it is an action into which we are being invited to come and be a part of that, to say yes to the kind of work that only God can do within us. That's really the invitation of what we're commemorating. It is out of that that our hearts are changed. It is out of that that we can begin to see ourselves not as meager, but instead as people who, though broken, are receiving a new kind of power in their lives, an ability by God's power to begin to live in a new kind of way, to be generous, kind givers, 
people through whom the power of the Spirit begins to work, where we begin to learn the disciplines of forgiveness and generosity, where we're learning how to serve people, where we're learning how to live not from me, but rather, God, what would you have me do? Because what has been birthed in us is larger, more powerful, and more mighty than anything else we could have ever imagined. To commemorate the baptism of Jesus is a commemoration of dedication. It is an act of saying again, yes, to that which God both has given us and is giving us even now. It's not by coincidence or just the bishop's visit that confirmation and reception and reaffirmation are happening on this, the feast day of the baptism of Jesus. And you all will also with them be reaffirming these commitments. What makes that possible is what we see in the gospel. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will come into the depths of your heart, change you and give you a power that you never knew that was possible. Changing your life in such a way is that even in the midst of the worst and the most difficult of circumstances, what you know is the companionship of his presence. And even in the midst of hardship, a genuine sense of peace and joy. Because his promise is, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's today. That's the feast of the baptism of Jesus. It is not merely an observance. It is an act of dedication. So as we move into confirmation, I would encourage you that as we enter into the liturgy, just don't let it flow off your lips. Yeah, it's what we say now, isn't it? No, instead, think carefully and allow those words to be expressions of your heart that the mighty power of the Holy Spirit might in a new way be at work in your life. Amen.